Thank you so much for coming back for the keynote sessions. Before announcing our speakers, we would like to thank our gold partners, partners that without whom this event would not be possible. Trezor, Liberland, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, and the Ayn Rand Center Europe. So thank you so much for our sponsors. Thank you. We have very special guests for this, for this keynote session. Uh, first off, Dr. Steve Davies. He's the head of education at the Institute of Economic Affairs in London. From 1979 till 2009, he was senior lecturer in the Department of History and Economic History at Manchester Metropolitan University, where he taught courses on a range of topics, including world history, the history of crime, and the criminal justice system in the UK. Dr. Steve Davies. Next up, Dr. David Friedman is a free market economist and legal scholar. He is um, a consequentialist libertarian and author of the book, The Machinery of Freedom, Guide to a Radical Capitalism, which was published in 1973, uh, in which he explains how a society with property rights and without government would function. Dr. Friedman, thank you. And this session will be moderated by Dr. Wolf von Lahr, CEO of Students for Liberty. The topic is... <laughs> you were so quick. And he was very quick before I could tell you just before. The, the topic of this discussion is Prospects for Liberty. So thank you so much. Welcome, welcome everyone. Come on in. It's time. It's getting started. And uh, I'm very happy to also announce that right now we have over 700 people here at this very event. So give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> Wonderful. And so let's jump in. We will do roughly 20 minutes of conversation here on stage. And then all of you have also the chance to ask some brilliant, thoughtful and short questions uh, to the panelists here. So. First, I would like off to start with saying that this is a very important, crucial topic right now specifically. What is the prospects for liberty? What is coming down the pipeline right now? The world seems to be ever-changing and there is a lot of interesting aspects happening right now. So first, I would like to ask both of you, um, what would you consider the biggest threat to liberty right now? And I provide you with a few options. One is COVID. Another one is the imperial powers like China and Russia. Um, or it might be inflation and the central banks that cause it, or it might be even populism. And uh, I think you might even have like a different answer than on my list, but let's first start with Steve. What's your take on that? Uh, well, thanks, Wolf. Well, my answer is the fourth one, except that the phenomenon which I see as the greatest threat to liberty is not populism. I think that's the wrong label for it. Uh, what we're talking about here is two things, I think. One is the rise in many most, in fact, developed countries, and also quite a lot of middle-income countries, of a kind of explicitly anti-liberal politics uh, on both the left and the right, but primarily on the right. And if you're the kind of age that I am, then you've grown up thinking that all the major threats to liberty come from the left, from communism or uh, related ideologies. But in fact, what we're now seeing, as Tom Palmer sort of very powerfully, I think, argued earlier on today, is the growth of an explicitly anti-liberal politics on, on the right, a sort of fascism not so light in many cases. Uh, and that's a major threat, it seems to me, uh, not least because of the way it's leading to uh, a complete corruption of right-wing politics. And it grows out of the second thing, which is related to it, which is a progressive breakdown, I think, of the whole public conversation in liberal democratic societies. And we can argue about exactly what is causing this. Maybe it's technology. Maybe it is indeed being stirred up by hostile powers like the Russians. I tend to think it's, it's endogenous. But undoubtedly, there's a real problem of a complete inability, I think, increasingly, to have any kind of humane or sensible conversation, which is leading to this phenomenon of political polarization. And that is directly antithetical to liberty, it seems to me. So I think that those two conjoined phenomena are the big threat for me. I think none of your first three is a very serious threat. That Russia is in the process of losing a war against a country about a quarter its size. 
uh, inflation is a nuisance and it may be a serious problem for a country like the US when it has to pay interest uh, on its national debt at uh, eight or 10 percent instead of at two percent once uh, interest rates adjust to inflation. Uh, but inflation is not a very large tax because it's only a tax on cash balances that most of my assets are in a money market fund and they're ultimately stocks, shares of stock which are gonna go up along with the price level in general. Uh, what was your third? Oh, COVID. COVID is mostly over, which is why we're here. Uh, and COVID has had both good and bad effects. Uh, it is on the one hand legitimized uh, government violations of individual freedom that we would normally not put up with. On the other hand, it's also considerably reduced the reputation of governments with their populace uh, since they kept saying things that weren't true. Uh, and at least in the US, COVID has seriously undermined the public school system because the public school system in the US performed very badly. And I think a whole lot of people have now started taking seriously the idea of educating their kids themselves, which is an enormous improvement. Uh, I think populism in the sense in which Steve mentioned it is a serious threat, but I think the more serious threat is environmentalism and in particular concern with global warming. Uh, there's a wonderful quote somewhere from uh, Mencken to the effect that governments like to terrorize their population with uh, bogus threats. And if you look at serious estimates of global warming, it may be a minor problem. The, 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 uh, William Nordhaus, who supports doing stuff against global warming, who got a Nobel Prize for his economic work, if you actually read what he says, his estimate of how much worse off the world will be if we do nothing about global warming by the end of the century is the equivalent of a 2.5% reduction in world GNP. That's a wet firecracker. Uh, he's not willing to say that it's a wet firecracker, but if you actually look at his numbers, it is. Nonetheless, if you look at discussion of global warming, it's hundreds of millions of climate refugees and the world getting flooded and a whole bunch of other things. So that kind of rhetoric, to the extent people believe it, justifies very large government activities. And so that's, I think, probably the most serious threat at the moment. But in general, things are always going in both directions. That that people's beliefs are getting better in some ways and worse than others. Things like COVID do good and damage. Uh, technological change means that it's easier to do mass production surveil surveillance, but also easier to conceal your correspondence with people via encryption and so forth and so on. So there isn't a simple answer. Very good, provocative, uh, David, for sure. So you are addressing mostly a room full of Gen Zs and millennials. And just by the statistics, it shows that most people do care on that in that age bracket very much about the environment. You say, nah, it's not that big of a deal? Yes, that is to say, in the sense in which replacing socialism with environmentalism was an improvement is that intellectually it's a better argument that externalities are a real argument for uh, controlling people. The problem with that argument is that the controlling is being done by people who have less of an incentive to do the right thing than the people they're controlling. If you think, COVID is the interesting case because if you think as an economist about COVID, it is true that my incentive to avoid getting COVID is suboptimal. That if I get COVID, one cost is I might die and I really don't want to die. But another cost is that I might pass it on to other people. And the first is a private cost to me, the second is a public cost to other people. So I bear, let us say, 60% of the cost, of, of the, I get 60% of the benefit of my being careful. And I pay about 100% of the cost of my being careful in that I don't mm. get to do lots of things I like to do, like coming to Europe and giving talks. On the other hand, the, m people like Mr. Fauci who are making the decisions bear essentially none of the cost and receive very little of the benefit. His set of incentives is sort of a random set of incentives having to do with the political structure he's in. So although it's true that I will probably not make the right decision, I'm more likely to make the right decision than he is. And that's the problem very generally. That's the, what, what, what's wrong with the standard economic argument for governments doing things is that it correctly observes that laissez-faire doesn't give you the right answer and then supposes we have a mechanism that gives us a better answer, but we don't because political systems, the externalities to individuals' actions are usually close to 100%. That when you vote for the wrong person, other people bear the cost. 
uh, when you when a judge makes a bad decision, he doesn't bear the cost of the 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 rule, legal rule he set and so forth. So uh, you know, liberty is by no means perfect. It's just we have nothing better. Very good. Concentrated benefits, dispersed costs. You've heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. Very important. So, Steve, I saw you thinking very hard in that corner. Do you want to disagree a little bit with David here to make uh, for a good panel? Just, just slightly, because um, I do actually think, unlike David, that there is a real problem with climate change. Although I, I do agree with him that a lot of the warnings we get are, you know, completely over the top. However, he said that basically. Um, environmentalism concerns about climate change are going to justify extensive government intervention. My answer to that is, well, only if we let that side win the argument, because actually the coherent and I think correct position is to say that when you, if you are confronted with a challenge of this kind, you need the inventiveness and flexibility and resilience of a decentralized market society, a free society, more than ever. Uh, because it's actually that kind of way of organizing things that is more likely to produce solutions to challenges and problems uh, that are more effective and at lower cost because of the discovery procedure aspect of markets. Uh, the idea that you solve it by some kind of uh, national or even worse global Apollo project strikes me as absolute lunacy. So it doesn't follow even if you think that there is a problem with climate change, that therefore this requires large-scale collective political action. Um, you should be reading Eleanor Ostrom more, or people like that, I think, rather than think, going down that route. Very that good. is, Nordhaus argues for a carbon tax, and a carbon yeah. tax is a way of using the decentralized... Yeah, indeed, that is exactly, that's, that's a fairly you know, market-friendly policy but, solution. But, yeah. but I have no reason to believe that's what's going to actually happen. No. And in fact, in the case of the US, we had a uh, cap-and-trade bill which passed the House but not the Senate, and it's not the bill William Nordhaus would have written. No, absolutely. We need to make the argument better. So we also have heard here on the panel, interestingly, that inflation, and you, David, said that, might not be that much of a big deal. In a room of people who are students who are mostly on fixed income, it might be slightly different um, because they're not holding as many assets. However, I'm curious about both of yours prediction um, for the next five years when it comes to the economy and why. Like, what are we going to see? Are we going to see, like, a deflationary spiral? Um, are we going to see some sort of, like, continuous inflation, hyperinflation, or stagflation? Steve, if you want to take I've that one first. It's very hard to predict anything, particularly about the future, but um, I, I, I would say that I suspect, and I fear, if you ask me to bet on it, I would bet that we're going to get stagflation for most of the next five to six years. Um, we're currently experiencing a significant spike in inflation, which is due to the supply side disruptions brought about by the pandemic, uh, but also by the monetary response to the pandemic, when governments enormously expanded broad money, for good reasons at the time, actually, but which we're now paying the price of, because it's, this money um, is, they've got these huge monetary overhang, and as the velocity of money is returning to its average normal level, this means that all that money is now starting to circulate, and it's pushing up effective demand. Now, um, that is going to last longer than people think, I think, because the disruptions that the uh, pandemic brought to the supply chain are going to take, I think, longer to be resolved than many people realise. But I don't think that's the major problem. The ma that is transitory. You could expect inflation, if that were the only thing driving it, to fade away in about a year's time, maybe 18 months' time. Um, what I fear is this. We've also seen at the same time, for various reasons, significant rises in the cost of a number of key commodities, uh, which are not purely due to monetary uh, fluctuations, they're due also to geological realities, notably a rise in the price of oil. And governments are confronted with a very hard choice. What they could do is leave the money supply as it is, constrict it, and allow basically the majority of the population to take a hit in their living standards from this rise in costs. Uh, what they would have to do is, re it would not reduce aggregate demand, that would remain constant, but it would redistribute demand, the quantities of goods demanded, away from uh, goods with low elasticity of demand, essential goods, uh, and uh, towards them and away from uh, discretionary spending. Now, governments are very unlikely to do that because it's going to be politically very, very unpopular to do so. So my suspicion is that what they will do is actually turn the money taps back on. And that means that, therefore, we will have something like the phenomenon we experienced in the 1970s of uh, a combination of both a hit to production brought about by rising costs and uh, disruption to investment in other markets brought about by the inflation caused by the government's monetary response to that. And I think it will take several years before this works out. And the big problem is, and this is why I'm very, very glad that I'm not a central banker uh, at the moment, 
uh, because I think they're confronted with a really, really bad set of options, is that this will provoke a debt crisis because we have an enormous amount of both private and public debt out there. In fact, I think the private debt is more of a problem than the public debt, uh, corporate debt in particular. And if central banks in response to this do start to raise interest rates uh, seriously, as I think they will eventually, that means a whole lot of that debt is going to become basically unsound. It will not be repaid. It will be defaulted upon. So I think we are looking at a big debt crisis. Probably my guess is it would be in about three years' time, but that's pure speculation on my part, really. Yeah, very interesting because um, during Paul Volcker's time of the Federal Reserve, um, back then the GDP, uh, the, the debt to GDP ratio was around 20%, and he was able to raise interest rates to the same level because he could do that because then the debt didn't extend that much. But now we have in the United States and in many European countries 120% or more um, of debt as part of GDP, so that's not really an option that they have. But uh, what is your take, David? I'm not a macroeconomist. Uh, as best I can tell, a course in macro is a tour of either a cemetery or a construction site. Uh, my guess is that we will have continued inflation, but I am not going to try to make any predictions. All right, wonderful. Um, so then let's switch topics because we, we see threats from, from different perspectives and prospects for liberty. And we want to also turn to like a positive side, but first, some more negative stuff, right? Because that's what we really want, right, as consumers. Um, Looking at the recent aggression of, of Putin and its ever-increasing hostile rhetoric, what do you expect in the near future? You already hinted at that, that you think like this will not continue to go on for much longer, but a wounded animal often reacts in ways that is unpredictable, yes. and he has a wounded animal with some big guns, unfortunately, at his disposal. So um, walk us through your, your reasoning, what you think will, will play out there, and if there's like other maybe geopolitical ramifications yeah. that this brings about. Yeah. I think the most serious pro I think you're right the most serious problem is what is Putin's response to losing the Ukraine war and it might be nuclear weapons although it's not clear they're very useful for his purpose uh, he could try to use uh, tactical nukes against the Ukrainians but that's going to be very unpopular and it's not clear that it's a very effective tool for the purpose uh, and I'm not sure what else he can do that you know he could try to launch uh, World War 3 but he's not going to do very well on that he'll you know he, that would kill you know, he could probably kill 50 or 100 million Americans and 100 million Russians and, you know, other, other such things. It, it turns out, if you actually look at it, that although nuclear war is a pretty grim situation, it's not as grim as people pretend. It's not the end of the human race or the end of civilization. It's just killing more people than has ever been killed before, uh, which would be sort of unfortunate. Uh, I don't so think it's Don't very, worry about it. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't think it's very likely. Well, no, but... It would be a long discussion, but I, right. think, I, think, I think if you look at realistic estimates, you, you are talking about something maybe on the scale of the Black Death in Europe, that, which did happen, although a much smaller population at the time. Uh, but, but anyway, but I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't have a good enough feel for the internal dynamics of the Russian state. The question is, if it is clear has he, he has lost, does that mean that somebody will get rid of him? Are there other people who are in a position to pull a cookie? If he gets the army mad at him, because he's getting the army mad at him, right? He's, he's uh, re removing generals because they didn't do the impossible, basically, and he's going to be replacing them probably with less competent generals who won't do the impossible. And I'm not sure if it's... He's, he's got a situation where apparently some significant number of Russian soldiers are refusing to do what they're told because they haven't been paid. Uh, that he's got the problems of a corrupt and incompetent state trying to run a war. Uh, so I don't know, but, but if he can stay in power, then he's going to have to do something, and I don't know what he's going to do. But I can't, I can't see him trying to invade, you know, Poland, or I, he can invade Belarus, I suppose, but there's not much point to that. <laughs> uh, uh, so so I, don't, I don't know what he'll do, but I agree that that's, that that's the worry. But I think, I think the idea that he's going to crush the Ukrainians and then invade Poland and so forth is rather implausible. Well, it, it's, it's pretty obvious that Putin's made a catastrophic misjudgment from his point of view. Um, the, the month or so before the invasion happened, I, I would have, if you'd asked me, I would have given you slightly better than even money odds that there was going to be an invasion. So I thought the evidence was that on the balance of probabilities, he probably was more likely to invade than not. But the form the invasion took was not anything like what I had expected or what most military, you know, 
thinkers in the various think tanks from the armed forces expected because what everyone expected was that there would be an attack into the Donbass and along the Black Sea littoral. Uh, but instead, what you got was an attack on four or five broad fronts, which was obviously aimed at decapitating Ukrainian states, so at capturing Kiev, killing uh, Zelensky and most of the leading force in the government and putting a puppet government in place. And it was also launched in a way that had all the soldiers who actually know about this baffled because it didn't make effective use of combined arms operations, which is the kind of core feature of modern maneuver warfare, basically. And so it appears, the only explanation I've heard that makes any sense at all of this is that Putin and the leadership group in Russia thought that they had suborned and subverted enough leading figures in Ukraine that large parts of the Ukrainian army would just surrender and that they would be able to roll in. They maybe committed the common fault of despotic regimes of believing their own propaganda. Uh, and also the constant problem if you are a despot is that everyone is so terrified of you that nobody tells you the truth. Uh, this is the problem, you know, despots and tyrants have had throughout history. Whatever it was, they made a catastrophically bad mistake there. That and the heroic resistance that they faced um, has obviously already, um, you know, produced all the problems that David's mentioning. Now they've clearly gone back to trying to uh, make a breakthrough in the Donbass and then push uh, along the uh, Black Sea Littoral towards uh, Mikolaev again and uh, beyond that towards Odessa. Now, are they going to succeed in that? I mean, I'm not a soldier. But what I do know from history is that the general rule of thumb is that you're, if you're going to attack people in entrenched positions, established positions, you need a th at least a three to one uh, superiority in men and materiel before you even really think about doing it. You would really prefer to have a five to one superiority. Those are the rough rules of thumb. Uh, and they don't have it. Uh, partly because they've now lost so many uh, troops in the fighting up in the north and east of the country. So it is quite likely that in about another month and a half's time it will become obvious that even those more limited goals haven't been reached. Now, of course, they may still do it. Who knows? You know, war is one of the most uncertain of all human activities. The question then is what happens then? And that's where really it becomes very, very murky because all kind of, there's all kinds of possibilities. Um, Putin and the Russians might decide that they've declared a victory, you know, declare that they want a victory anyway um, to try and save face. They may try to just dig in themselves, in which case we're looking at a long conflict which will go on for a considerable time, could last for years. I mean, we could be looking at a really drawn out conflict with a pretty significant geopolitical global effects. It would force a realization that there is going to be a long systemic conflict between certainly Russia and the West, uh, maybe even a larger alliance of states, including China and the West. On the other hand, you could also see the collapse of the Russian army. I mean, this has happened before historically. Uh, and sometimes armies' morale just suddenly goes and they, they fall apart. But that's almost by definition impossible to predict. You, you can't really tell when it's going to happen. So I think that if by the end of the next like month or so, the Russians have not clearly made ground in their current offensive in the southeast of Ukraine, uh, then we are looking at either low probability, a effective collapse of the Russian army, or more likely, I think, a long, pretty long drawn out conflict. Very good. To summarize then, to somewhat of a careful optimism about the, the human atrociousness that is happening right now within the, the Russian-Ukraine conflict, that it might fizzle out and maybe there might be regime change at some point in within Russia. Um, but then skepticism about the, the the economy writ large over the next three to five years. I'm hearing that from the mm. both of you. So let's switch then. What gives you hope for the future? Prospects for liberty. Like we have great ideas. We're discussing them here. We're hearing them from great speakers like you. What gives you personally hope as the biggest opportunity for liberty loving people to, to make a difference in the world? Like, do you look at a technology? Do you look at an idea specifically and movement? One answer. But the what is your answer? Is very, I don't have one answer. The world is a very complicated place. And <laughs> the, the fact that they've abandoned centrally planned socialism is a big win. Uh, the fact that Americans no a lot of Americans no longer believe in the public schools is a big win. Uh, we may get a substantial spread of uh, voucher systems and of homeschooling, which would, in the long term, be an enormous benefit because it means you're no longer having kids being taught what the government wants them to, to, to learn. Also, they're more likely to learn stuff, which would be nice. Uh, and technology has potential for doing all sorts of great things, but at the same time, the same technologies can be used in bad ways. Uh, the existence of a pandemic uh, can people people can say well look 
there could be another and worse pandemic, so we've got to have all sorts of controls over what he will do. I just don't think you can predict in the cleanly way you'd like and say, this is the thing that's going to save us. And, you know, I'm an optimist by nature, but uh, I could be wrong. Uh, Are you I, giving me one answer, Steve? Well, no, I, I, I agree with what David said completely. I endorse all that. But on the other hand, the question really I think you're asking, Wolf, is like, if you wake up in the morning and you see the terrible headlines uh, in the press uh, and the dire prognostications that many people are making, what makes you think, no, no, you know, I'm still cheerful about the future? What kind of things give you hope, really? And I think that there, there are two things, really, well, maybe three. One of them is simply the general innovativeness, creativity, inventiveness, and adaptability of human beings. I have great faith and confidence that if you have even a reasonably free society, human beings will uh, be able to collectively and collaboratively, uh, through the discovery process of free exchange of ideas and other things, goods and services, work out solutions to those problems. Uh, and I think that at the moment, uh, let me say, I think the next t five to ten years are going to be seriously challenging for liberals everywhere, here in Europe, but it, throughout the world in general, because of the rise of the kind of politics that I mentioned, plus because of an extremely uh, no, rough economic uh, outlook, I think. So we need to be on our mettle. But I think that also, um, this is a challenge which I am ultimately confident will bring a response. Uh, and that response, I think, will be, uh, you know, I don't know what it might be yet, uh, almost by definition, because if I knew what it was, it would already have happened. Uh, but I think that there will be a response, and the, this events like this, uh, that's the second thing I'd mention, are the kind of thing that give me reasons for optimism, because uh, it's not the situation that people like Friedrich Hayek faced in uh, the aftermath of World War II, where there were just a bunch of old and not-so-old guys like himself. Uh, what we now have is a whole lot of young people, like all the people here in the hall. Uh, you've got a movement of people all over the world who are committed to the ideals uh, of individual liberty uh, and a free society. And that means that there's a kind of uh, force there and a pool of talent and creativity there, which I think will enable us to resolve these problems. So I can't give you a specific answer, um, but I think that we are going to face some very, very serious challenges in the next uh, five to ten years. But I think in some ways uh, that will actually provoke rethinking, new thinking, new ideas, new ways of organizing, new ways of doing things, uh, which will uh, lead us to see the challenges perhaps in some sense as a, a kind of necessary thing to bring about that, that rethinking. I would say one specific thing though, since you did ask for a specific thing, which is something David alluded to, which is the uh, loss of faith of um, parents in the state education system, which is particularly marked in the United States, but it's also found in Australia, it's found in Canada, found in quite a few European countries. And I think this is an aspect of a wider phenomenon, which I think is the crisis of meritocracy. And one of my very strongly held views is that meritocracy is one of the worst ideas ever, uh, and an even worse practice. And I think a lot of the uh, political problems that I alluded to in my first answer arise from the sociological consequences of the meritocratic system that we created, has been created after World War II. And I think the collapse of confidence in education that we're seeing at the moment is linked to the crisis of that system. And I think that can only be uh, to the benefit of uh, our cause, if you will. Along related lines, it seems to me that one of the big things that's happened both for good and for bad is the loss of faith in elites. Yes. That on the one hand, it explains why a lot of Republicans believe Trump won the election, because almost everything we believe depends on secondhand information. We observe very little of it. And once you've figured out that the New York Times can't be trusted, why should you believe them when they tell them that when they claim that your hero lost and you think he won? At the same time, that, that's unfortunate because he did lose, unfor well, fortunately, probably. Well, I don't know if it was fortunate or unfortunate. We had a choice between two bad candidates, different, different kinds of bad candidates. But at the same time, uh, it also means that people are less willing to be convinced of what the elite tells them about global warming or about the need for government intervention or whatever. One of the most optimistic things I've actually seen in recent years is a book some of you may have seen called The Beautiful Tree. And what it is about is private schooling in desperately poor countries. That basically it turns out that in places like India and much of Africa, a large fraction of the population is going to very inexpensive private schools. There are free public schools that are terrible. 
Uh, in some cases, in India, the private schools are probably illegal given the rules of the system, and yet poor people are managing to take care of their kids and to educate their kids despite the government. So that's a very optimistic thing along the lines that, that you were talking about. But Very good. So now we have some time for questions. So um, there's microphones going on here. So there have a gentleman over there. Yes, you, sir, there's somebody here. And please um, stand up, say your name and where you're from, and who should answer your brilliant question. One of these guys. Hello. Hi, I'm Stefan from France. Uh, David, could you elaborate a little bit on your fear about environmentalism? Sure. If we take the emblematic issue, which is how to reduce our carbon emissions, uh, what do you think should be done? Maybe a cap and trade, eventually uh, Nothing carbon so. tax, or and what do you think will probably be done if you put on your public yeah. choice hat? Thanks. Let me let me let me go back a step. Uh, about 40 years ago, the public issue that had the same status global warming has now was population. And we were warned that population growth would have catastrophic effects. Ehrlich predicted unstoppable mass famines for the 1970s. And he was taken seriously. He was on the extreme end of the orthodoxy, so to speak, but he was taken seriously. It was complete nonsense. And my conclusion at the time, I, I wrote a piece on it, was that increasing population had both positive and negative effects and they were sufficiently uncertain that we could not tell whether the net effect was positive or negative. That's also my view on climate change, that as far as I can tell, what's really going on is that climate change has both negative and positive effects. Both are large. The current orthodoxy ignores the positive effects and looks at the negative effects and says, aha, it's a terrible thing, we've got to do things to stop. So that as far as I'm concerned, we would be better off if we ignored the whole thing for the next 30 or 40 or 50 years until we had better information on, 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 on the effects. What I think will happen, however, very likely will happen, is that enough people are scared enough so that the government will intervene in large ways in large and sometimes crazy ways. I mean, the suppression of nuclear reactors is obviously exactly the opposite of what you should be done in terms of their own theory, because nuclear reactors are a form of power that does not produce CO2. Uh, nonetheless, they're shutting them down. And, and so I think you're gonna have sizable interferences with interference with human activity. Uh, whether it will be enough to be you know, a catastrophe, I don't know, probably not. But it does seem to me that it's at this point the largest excuse for governments doing things which they have a political incentive to do, finding ways of benefiting their supporters uh, and of imposing things. There, there's a wonderful cartoon that I, I pointed out in my blog a long time ago where somebody is listing a whole, on a blackboard, a bunch of things you have to do in order to, to prevent cli climate change. And the point is they're all supposed to be good things anyway. So the commenter is saying, you know, what, wouldn't it be terrible if, if it turned out climate change wasn't a problem and we had prevented uh, pollution and uh, bad effects of urbanization and all sorts of terrible things for nothing? Well, once, once it turns out that people believe that all the things they want to do are good anyway, then climate change becomes an excuse for doing them. Very good. Then a question from the right-hand side of the room. Let's take somebody from the right, right here. Or there's one guy there. Yes. Oh. Yeah. You're yep. doing it equally, oh. like first middle. Okay. So, Doctor Davies, um, I want to understand better what you're talking about. Uh, your your feelings about meritocracy. So, kind of what yep. was your definition of meritocracy in um, two parts? So, and secondly, I mean, yeah. What? How do you see? In what ways do you think we ha we have meritocracy in some places, and why is that bad? And then. Also, what is sort of the simplest form, in your view, of a general, per, a, a good form of general purpose governance? Uh, what's sort of the simplest system for us? Okay. Um, well, meritocracy um, is the term is. It was an invented word. It was invented back in 1959 by the British sociologist Michael Young, and he actually meant it to be a pejorative term, and much to his horror, it got taken up as a positive term. Uh, now, what people think it means is that you should give the jobs 
in general to the people who are best qualified to do them and not to your mate or you know, your mate's son and this kind of thing. Uh, if, it's, if that is what it was, then obviously nobody could object to it. But actually, it isn't that. What meritocracy is, is the theory, first of all and centrally, that some kinds of work and therefore some kinds of job and role are more virtuous, more meritorious uh, more valuable, if you will, not in monetary terms, but in terms of so social value generally, than others. And that the way to decide who gets those jobs, uh, as opposed to the apparently less valuable other kinds of activity, is through merit, which is defined as being, in Young's term, talent plus effort. Now, the trouble is, how do you establish who has the talent and has put the effort in? Well, that's where it gets really bad, because the way we decide to do it is through academic attainment. And I think that uh, meritocracy is actually an ideology in the original Friedrich Engels sense of the word. It's an apparently neutral scientific theory which serves the class interests of a particular social group, which is the uh, professionally certified managerial class in our society. And it enables them to feel very, very good about themselves. And one of Michael Young's original problems with this was that it produced a ruling elite who are unbelievably smug and self-satisfied because they believe that they are where they are and are better than everybody else because they, they have merit. Uh, and that's, you know, that's simply not true in many cases. Plus, what it leads to is the idea that uh, to go to your second part of the question, that the way to have an efficient or effective system of governance is to have smart people in charge. That is totally wrong. Having smart people in charge is almost always a recipe for disaster. Uh, no, a classic case in point was the US Defense Department during the Vietnam War, run by the best and the brightest, as they call them at the time. The problem is really smart people tend to have an inflated idea of how well they understand the world, how much they know about it, and how much they can control it. You do not want smart people in charge. What you want in charge is people with good judgment. And the only way you can find out who has good judgment is by experience, by seeing who does it. That's what Napoleon meant when promoting people to marshal. He used to ask, is he lucky? What he meant was, has he consistently shown good judgment? Uh, and no, give me an ounce of good judgment outweighs, you know, a million IQ points, basically. Uh, and what a meritocracy has done is to create an enormously self-satisfied and smug elite and a deeply resentful uh, population who feel that they are failures in life uh, because they haven't succeeded in jumping through the hoops. And committing the pretense of knowledge every day. I have not forgotten about you guys on the left, so who do we have here? Yes, gentlemen there. One question, please. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, great. Yes, so I am Wojtek from here, from Czech Republic, and this question goes to both of you. I think the, the question is like, how would you judge the Western government's response to the Ukrainian crisis? Like, did they do enough? Did they not do enough? Or like, overall, how do you think about it? How do you feel about that? So you can response to which crisis? To the Ukrainian, Ukrainian crisis. crisis yes. um, well, uh, it's been more dramatic than I thought it would be, quite frankly. Um, and I think that the problem is you have the, you have the problem of how to respond to an act of aggression by a nuclear power. Uh, and that means that certain things that, in theory, Western governments could do, they can't do because they, they not, you obviously don't want to get into a shooting war with a power ruled by a despot who might use nuclear weapons. I mean, I, I don't take quite such a sanguine view of a nuclear war as David does. Um, I, I'd like to avoid something that kills as large a proportion of world population as the Black Death, thank you very much. Um, I think their response has, on the whole, been pretty good, with a one major limitation, which is that um, you know, they haven't put an embargo on the oil. But I can see why they haven't, because the results will be very, very bad in the short term. What I am surprised about is the, basically the seizing or freezing of the assets of Russia's central bank. That really was dropping the financial nuclear weapon. Uh, and that could actually have some pretty significant long-term effects, which might not work out that well for the United States, actually, because I'm pretty sure the Chinese government and a bunch of other governments are thinking, wait a minute, those dollar balances we have are maybe not quite as safe as we thought they were. And they're going to start thinking very hard about how to uh, you know, get themselves out of this vulnerable position. So although I think that was the right thing to do, it may actually not redound to the United States benefits in the medium to longer term. Yeah, I'm not sure if that was the right thing to do. I think providing weapons to the Ukrainians made a whole lot of sense that after all, the advantage that the US has were very rich 
and Russia is pretty poor, and we can therefore provide a great many more bullets to the Ukrainians than the Russians can provide to the Russians, and the Ukrainians are willing to fight for a good reason. So it seems to me that it was a, a, sensible, a sensible tactic from the standpoint of the NATO powers. I think that actually going to war would have probably have been a mistake. It was a dangerous, and it turned out it wasn't necessary, so far at least. I haven't figured out why we wouldn't let the Poles provide uh, fighter jets to the Ukrainians, which it seems to me is no more pushing over the line than the things we're already doing. Uh, we're letting the Turks provide uh, fighter, unmanned fighters, as it were, to the... Uh, to so, so, but other than that, it seems to me that the, the general idea of we will provide them lots and lots of, of ammunition and equipment and they can then fight the Russians and they're successfully doing. Now, if the Russians had been winning, there would be a much stronger argument for a NATO involvement, but fortunately that didn't happen. And, uh, my comment, my, my reaction at the beginning of the war was that in order for the Russians to lose, it was necessary that the Russian army be a good deal worse than we thought it was and the Ukrainian army a good deal better. And fortunately, both of those conditions turned out to be true. Uh, but no, I, I think actually on, on the point that uh, President Davies made, I'm not at all sure it wasn't a mistake. That is, it seems to me that we would like to have a world which is economically interdependent uh, and it becomes less economically interdependent if we say we are not obliged to keep our obligations to countries that we don't like, which is in effect what we're doing. We're saying, you know, we've got stuff of yours that's supposed to belong to you, but we're holding it. Guess what? We're not letting you have it. So that seems to me have been a, a dangerous decision and I'm not sure it was necessary. Uh, and I wish I could listen to the disagreement, but I'm German, so we end on time. I thank the. <laughs> <laughs> I really thank both Professor Davis and uh, Professor Friedman here for your your brilliant answers to questions, and you will be around for longer. So please grab them and answer every question. Thank you.